The winter of 2021 in Buffalo came mildly, with only a few inches of snow in November and December. Tempted by the mild weather, my neighbors and I speculated that perhaps the scourge of global warming had finally defeated the brutal lake effect that ravages us every year. It wasn't serious. January brought sub-zero temperatures and more than 50 inches of snow and sleet. Overwhelming proof that at least for the moment, Jack Frost is still beating the crap out of Al Gore's inconvenient truth. Buffalo does a good job of clearing snow from the streets, but it was still a nasty drive for most of that winter. As the owner of my own company, Jim Carlisle Marketing, I had an easier time than most. I could usually work from home, a privilege I extended to my employees when the weather got particularly rough. Our specialty was producing engaging, somewhat truthful paid articles that presented our clients in a new and surprising light. For example, one of our clients was Timber Valley, a local retirement village. Instead of focusing on the facilities, pools, art rooms, and semi-independent apartments, as usual, we commissioned articles about the link between exercise and delayed aging and illustrated them with photos of Timber Valley residents ziplining, jet skiing, mountain hiking, and other strenuous activities. In the first quarter after our articles were published, sales increased 5%. In the second quarter, we began offering discounts for extended family members, and sales increased 9%. Later, when we introduced the hashtags hash wild retirement and hash timber valley for life, sales increased 13% and they continue to grow. My job isn't rocket science, but I think it's fair to say that it takes a special kind of weird brain to position the death waiting room as life's next adventure for the Woodstock generation. Fortunately, I have such a brain, and I seem to attract similarly weird people. Together, we've turned daydreams that nearly got me kicked out of sixth grade into a career that recently crossed the six-figure line. And uh, that doesn't mean I spend all my time with my head in the clouds. My job relies on picking up small details and building stories around them, so I like to think I'm on top of things, at least until I let my mind wander. Which, admittedly, I'm prone to. My wife Linda, on the other hand, has always had her feet firmly on the ground. As office manager at Sprague, Sprout and Screwy, one of Buffalo's largest law firms, she had to manage a herd of overly ambitious and anxious lawyers into something resembling a functional firm. I was a little nervous when she started working there. Legal ethics is more of a joke than a strict rule, and I'd heard too many stories of workplace shenanigans. But her first office Christmas party put my mind at ease. It soon became clear that while Linda was essentially a stay-at-home mom to an office full of stoned bonobos at Spanish Fly, she viewed her charges with a kind of disgust and bewilderment. Linda had to be in her office from 9 to 5, regardless of the weather, so I was the one who walked our kids, Emma, age 8, and Tommy, age 6, to school in the mornings and picked them up in the afternoons. By default, this meant I was also the primary parent, the one who handled doctor's appointments and teacher conferences, organized cupcakes for birthdays, and transported the kids to playdates. I usually treasured that. My dad missed most of my childhood, and I considered myself lucky to be able to see my kids grow up. But it wasn't always sunny and rosy. That winter, due to school closings, I spent a lot of my time as a stay-at-home dad, tormented by the muffled sound of Frozen coming from the living room, and repeatedly having to interrupt my work to serve snacks, resolve conflicts, and tell stories to a couple. Despite my best efforts to get the kids out into the yard, the icy temperatures and huge drifts of snow usually kept us skulking inside. By the time Valentine's Day loomed on the horizon, I began to understand in a new way why the Donner Party ended the way it did. I think maybe it wasn't just the food. Linda was feeling a little better about her job. At least she could spend the day socializing with adults. But I could tell the walls were closing in on her as well. In a burst of optimism and desperation, she and the other wives in our circle planned a big Valentine's Day outing. The women got down to business. They bought new dresses, took care of childcare, made reservations at a first-class restaurant, and found a club known for good cocktails and great dancing. It was to be a grand celebration of getting through the harsh winter and a little energizer to get them through to spring. Linda rolled the dice when another storm hit, dumping a ton of snow and shutting down half the city. The club closed, 
the restaurant canceled our reservation, and the state police advised everyone to limit travel to only necessary errands. Even if they hadn't all intervened, I'm sure Linda would have wanted to cancel the trip. The temperature was well below freezing, and her new dress and shoes would have looked strange over thermal underwear and wool knee socks. So on the morning of February 14th, I found myself shoveling a foot and a half of snow off the driveway. Not that we were going to go outside anytime soon, but with two kids in the house, you can't afford to be snowbound. Besides, it gave me a little respite from listening to Frozen. The irony of Emma and Tommy's obsession with Frozen did not go unnoticed by me. If Disney's addictive nugget makes kids think of the magic of snow and ice, so much the better. As for me, my thoughts leaned more toward Jack London's Making Fire and that group of rugby players who crashed in the Andes in the 1970s. The snowblower was in the repair shop that morning, and I imagined myself slaving away in a windy prison. Jimmy DeFran's muscles tensed as he pushed his battered shovel through the snowdrift. Cold enough for you, Red? He turned to his friend, who was digging his own ditch in the pleasure yard. No, Jimmy, I like it a few degrees colder, replied Red thoughtfully. It makes me feel fresh and young, like beer in the refrigerator. Hadley, the toughest cog in Shawshank, shouted at them. You're not at a tea party, ladies. Less talk, more shoveling. Red and Jimmy got back to business. Cranky, cranky, Jimmy muttered loud enough for Red to hear. Like he's cold or something. Red coughed what sounded like a giggle. No, Jimmy. Hell doesn't get cold. Jimmy DeFriend shoveled the snow and smiled his enigmatic smile, thinking of the Rita Hayworth poster hanging in his cell, fluttering in the icy draft. I must say that by mid-February, even my daydreams had become a little gloomy. Tapping my shovel on Linda's bumper, I cast an angry glance at the sticker she had affixed. A woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Damn, Gloria Steinem. Look, I get this Steinem plea. A man basically needs food, shelter, air, and at least in Buffalo in February, a very warm coat. But love, romance, not so much. You don't need them to survive or to define yourself as an independent being in this world. But Lord, you start your negotiations with the phrase, I don't need you? Imagine starting a work meeting with the words, I don't need you for shit. Whether it's true or not, it gives the impression that you have no intention of building a relationship. When Linda put a sticker on her car, I printed out a couple dozen that read, A man needs a woman like a lobster, needs a chainsaw, and stuck one on the back of my Ford Expedition. I think she got the point but didn't see the irony. Truth be told, Linda has no tolerance for irony. She's smart, loving, and has a great sense of humor, but sometimes she gets carried away with phrases like, The future is women. My body. My choice. Act with the confidence of a mediocre white male. A woman's place is in the House of Representatives and the Senate. It's not that I completely disagree with her slogans, although the future is for women really pisses me off. I'm for bodily autonomy, equal pay, equal political power, and equal opportunity. I'm proud of my mother and grandmother who went to college, had great careers, and fought prejudice in the workplace. And as the father of a little girl, I am ready to challenge anyone who tries to deny Emma any opportunities. At all. Seriously, if the kid wants to be a welder, I will buy her an acetylene torch. But sound, us versus them arguments tended to creep into Linda's worldview. Sometimes, instead of seeing herself as an advocate for equality, she behaved more like a suicide bomber on the front lines of the battle between the sexes, desperate to show that she was a totally independent woman who would not bend to the needs of any man. As the man closest to her, and as the guy who sometimes had to ask her to bend to the needs of our family, I sometimes felt like I was being forced into the role of adversary rather than ally. Plus, the joking joking I hate boys got on my nerves. This kind of faux feminism started going out of style about a decade ago, but don't tell Linda about it. Seriously, don't tell her. I've tried it, and it's no fun at all to be in the position of a man explaining feminism to his wife unless you have a very comfy couch. Fortunately, such arguments were rare. We were mostly lovers and confidants 
ardent fans and best friends. We shared household chores fairly fairly. I was better at cooking, she was better at laundry, we both hated vacuuming, and kept the house in order. Given my flexible schedule, I was usually babysitting, which I enjoyed, at least when we weren't snowed in. Speaking of which, I was also in charge of snow removal. And after the driveway was shoveled and I warmed up a bit, we were both going to spend an hour or two riding around the yard with the kids. Valentine's Day downtown would be lovely, but as I thought about how I'd be sculpting igloos and snowmen with Linda, Emma, and Tommy, I had to admit that my life couldn't get any better. Next chapter. Linda was determined, so I wasn't surprised when she, Dee, Jane, and the other wives moved our Valentine's Day party, dubbed Goodbye February, We Won't Miss You, to the last day of the month. The new and improved plan was even more ambitious. In addition to dinner and dancing, we were going to spend the night in a nearby hotel. Linda decided that even if the restaurant and club closed, it would be good for us to spend the night alone in an unfamiliar bed, doing things that would scare the kids. I was in complete agreement. By the end of February, I would have gladly given the finger for the chance to savor overpriced beer and roasted cashews and honey from a wet bar in a room where they weren't spinning frozen. It says a lot when a hotel room picnic starts to feel like a combination of Nirvana, Shangri-La, and the last five minutes of 2001, a space odyssey. This time, the weather favored us, giving us a couple of days when the temperature rose to a, relatively, pleasant 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Linda was able to shed her long underwear, and her blue sleeveless dress was a vivid reminder that underneath all those winter layers, my wife is a goddess. I wasn't too bad myself. Although I'd only been to the gym a couple times since early January, shoveling snow is a great workout, and I looked pretty solid in my best suit. The evening started off beautifully. We had survived most of the winter, the kids were fine, work was great, and we were in love. It's a cliche, but shared struggles do bring couples closer together, and we had never been closer than when we walked into Morrison's, the club where we were going to spend the night dancing before retiring to our hotel room for more delightful aerobic exercise. It was crowded. Apparently, we weren't the only ones desperate to get out of the house. It was a younger crowd, and I recognized a few players from the Bills, our hometown football team. On the dance floor, we are fluid movements. Poetry. Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, sans wig. Silver Linings Playbook, without the craziness. I unwind her, and her fingertips slide to the end of my hand. Her eyes stare into mine, burning with desire. She caresses my hand as I wrap my arm around her waist. Our legs are perfectly synchronized. Come here often? She sighs, her eyes glistening with desire. Only with the right partner, I whisper in her ear. She flinches. I'm the right partner? I wrap my arms around her, my eyes. The only partner. Her pelvis presses against me. Every nerve in my body. Her body is raw and hungry, desperately absorbing the touch of our skin through the clothes. Her breath hitches, and I can smell her, under the perfume, under the familiar bouquet of her shampoo, the musky, needy scent of my wife, my partner. I can feel spring budding inside me, coming alive after months of winter hibernation. It's nice when my daydreams match reality. When the music ended, we returned to the table. My goodness, exclaimed Jane, fanning herself. I think you've melted the dance floor. Linda fancied herself as she reached her seat. No kidding, said Dee, her face flushed. Where did you learn that? We took dance lessons when we were in college, I said. It was an elective, and the professor took us as partners. It kind of became our thing. One of our things, Linda corrected me. The table erupted into laughter. I've got the next one, Linda, said Dee's husband, Dave. Dee smiled and I assumed she had her own plans, but Linda quickly interrupted Dave. No, all my dancing tonight is for my husband. Then she looked at me and her eyes softened. I think one or two more, she whispered, and I nodded my head. It was a perfect night.
and then Marc Lavalier showed up. Next chapter. Uh, when Linda dropped my hand and rushed onto the dance floor with Lavalier, I didn't immediately realize what was happening. At first I thought it was a joke that she'd turn around, come back and say, just kidding baby, let's get out of here. But then she didn't. As I watched them move across the floor, it began to dawn on me that my wife had left me without a word. In the blink of an eye, I went from the spouse equivalent of a beach in Aruba to a snowbank in Alaska. I started to get up, but Jane put her hand on my shoulder. Let her take this, she said. It's Mark Lavalier, the Bill's new quarterback. I brushed her hand away, but she clung to my shoulder. Don't, she hissed, her fingers clenched. It's only a dance, Jim. Let her do it. I stared at Linda on the dance floor and felt numb, isolated. Looking at the smug smiles of the women at the table and the embarrassed expressions of their husbands, I felt exposed, humiliated. I had two choices. Do as I was told and sit down like a good boy or make a scene and make my humiliation even more public, even more embarrassing. Screw you, Linda. I imagined how I'd act if this were a movie, if I were some international assassin or former Navy SEAL with a dark past. Do you mind if I cut in? I asked, walking up to the couple. Find your own, Lavalier grinned. This one's already taken. Yeah, she's taken, I growled. She's my wife. Jim, please, Linda said, keeping her eyes on Lavalier. Just one song. I don't think so, I said. Lavalier barely had time to turn away from her before he was stabbed in the back. Ibrahim Moises and Dan Smith, the Bills' quarterback and receiver, came out of the crowd, but Lavalier put his hand up and they stopped. I'll handle it, he said. Hubby will be a good boy and let us finish our dance. I froze. The orchestra switched to a lilting instrumental composition. The talking stopped and the room fell silent. Behind me, a flock of pigeons took off. I wiped my lips. Blood. Smiling, I stood up straight, dropped my arms to my sides, and raised my eyes to Lavalier. He grinned. I don't think so, I growled. I'm not going to lose to a tightwad who chokes on big punches. I snatched up my Springfield Armory M, 1911A1 V12 dual pistol. The pistols exploded, taking out Moises and Smith. I ducked behind one of the tables as Lavalier drew his weapon, a Beretta 92 FS Inox, and shoved Linda into the crowd. He fired twice. Dee's head exploded into pieces, and Jane coughed up blood after being shot in the neck. Good riddance. I rose from my hiding place, weapon at the ready. No. No. This wasn't an old John Woo movie, and it wasn't a nightmare. My wife was actually dancing with this asshole in a crowded club, leaving me behind while she watched him like he was hanging from the moon and stars. I had no weapons, no intrusive soundtrack, no line of attack near me. Yes, I was in good shape, but I was under no illusions about facing a handful of football players. And by the looks of it, my wife was. And that's the most important thing, isn't it? Because Lavalier didn't drag her along, she went willingly, she dropped me like a hot potato, never looked back. Even now her eyes were fixed on him as far as she knew. I wasn't in the room at all. Through the confusion and rage, questions rained down on me. What kind of woman does this? What kind of person? I won't pretend I wasn't in a blinding rage at Lavalier, but was it his fault? Sure, he was a scumbag who amused himself by dancing with married women and humiliating their husbands but I could hardly blame him for his infatuation with Linda. Besides, he had made no promises to me and was under no obligation to be faithful to me. But Linda, she owed me a lot. She owed me more than that. Watching her on the dance floor, I saw something, and so clearly that I wondered why I hadn't noticed it sooner in all the other arguments and petty squabbles that had marked our time together. La Valliere wasn't my opponent. Linda was. She had made herself my adversary. Even if I had a formidable weapon in my hands, a soundtrack playing, and a line of offense behind me, or, at the very least, 
If I had grabbed one of the knives from the table and stuck it between Lavalier's ribs, I still wouldn't have won. Linda decided to do just that, decided to put a few dances with this manicured dirtbag above our marriage. She decided she was an independent, strong woman who needed a man. Her man, like a fish, needs a bicycle. She created the problem. I couldn't solve it for her. She had to choose her marriage and me, whatever it was. She had to bend. If she didn't, we would break. So I sat and pondered and thought dark thoughts for two songs while the others at the table made lame attempts at conversation. I saw Lavalier nod to the band leader, and I saw him nod back. The third, fourth, and fifth songs were slow dances, and they were all performed one after the other. Lavalier's dance with Linda was a parody of ours. Instead of our graceful seduction and flowing movements, his dance was a dance of dominance, with a man stomping across the dance floor to seize control of the woman. Linda didn't seem to mind. Apparently a little toxic masculinity was in order, as long as she was the belle of the ball. Finally, Lavalier nodded to the band leader, and the music changed to something more rhythmic. He and Linda stepped out of the embrace, and he leaned over and whispered in her ear. Her smile widened. With one last squeeze of her forearm, he released her and headed to his table. She turned to me, and for the first time since that asshole had dragged her out onto the dance floor, I saw her eyes. Their sparkling brilliance faded at the sight of me. Saw her radiant smile turn into something cold and stiff and fake. Damn. Linda could be a pretty good actor when she tried, and she tried her best as she walked toward me. But she couldn't hide the look on her face that showed I'd gone from the love of her life to a problem to be dealt with. She was almost to her seat when Dee jumped up, her own glee giving a new impetus against the dull terror in my wife's eyes. Linda, you were great, exclaimed Dee. My wife's frozen smile widened and became genuine. My heart dropped even lower. When I stood up, the other couples in our group were looking at everything but me. Dee leaned over and whispered something in Dave's ear. His face turned red, and he put his hand to his mouth. What was he hiding? A grimace? A smirk? Linda, I have to go to the bathroom, Dee said, her voice unnaturally bright. Come with me. Linda looked at me again, and I saw her eyes sparkle. And I realized. Shit. Her body. Her choice. Damn it. And then my wife left with her best friend, and I stood alone, feeling like the world's biggest jackass. My skin felt prickly, and I could feel the stares of the whole room on me. Saw the smirks, barely covered by my hands. I coughed. I'm sorry, I mumbled. I need a drink. Jim, I... began Dave. Don't, I growled. Don't say a word. His eyes widened and he went back to looking at the glasses on the table. I don't know what he saw in my face, but I felt a ripple of grim satisfaction. Our friends were silent as I left. It had been a busy evening, and the bartenders were in a hurry to fulfill all the orders, but it didn't matter. The last thing I needed right now was another overpriced gin and tonic. From the bar, I had a good view of the back of the club. Moises and Smith turned down a hallway and passed the restrooms. Shit, I muttered as Dee stepped outside. She was scanning the crowd, looking for me. I wasn't hard to find. There weren't too many guys making their way across the dance floor, heading toward the back hallway. But by the time Dee saw me, I was practically on top of her. Jim! She exclaimed. Not now, asshole! I shoved her out of my way. At the end of the hallway, the exit door was already open, and I saw Linda rush out into the parking lot, Lavalier following her. Two linemen were blocking the door. I lunged at them. I may not have been a John Woo character, but I was furious. Hey, Linda! I bellowed, pushing my way past Moises and Smith. Hey, bastard! I shouted. Lavalier must have recognized the name, because he turned to me and already had his hands up when I came at him. He shoved me hard, and I had a split second to see his smirk before I punched him in the face. I felt something snap in my hand as I prepared to throw another punch, but suddenly my hands were pinned behind my back. Bastard knocked me down! Someone behind me said. The guy's got talent. 
Lavalier rubbed his jaw. Not bad, he smirked. Not good enough, but not bad. He turned to Linda. Go to the car, to the white Escalade. Mark, it's okay. I'll be there in a second. I looked up at her, saw her wide eyes. Then I saw the calculation in them, her body, her choice. She turned away and started walking toward the car. Linda, shouted I. She slowed her step. Last chance, Linda, I said. She started walking faster. Go home, Jim, she called over her shoulder. Screw you, Linda. She was almost to the car when Lavalier's fist smashed into my face. It hurt. It hurt a lot. But it was nothing compared to what I felt when I saw her running away. He hit me again, and a wave of agony swept through my head, drowning out everything in its path. I felt dizzy, and it became too heavy to lift. Three on one, I muttered, trying to focus my eyes. If it makes you feel any better, we'll be one on one in my bedroom tonight, Lavalier grinned. He punched me again, this time in the side, and my breath caught. He laughed. Don't worry, I'll bring her back tomorrow. Don't worry, I sighed. A woman who has fun with a piece of shit like you isn't worth much. I tried to lift my head, but it was still too heavy. Don't kill him, Lavalier called out from a distance. Then I was dragged back to the club. I threw my head back and saw Linda and Lavalier in the car, their lips already locked together. I think her head was already on its way to his lap when Morrison's back door closed and I was plunged into darkness. Next chapter. When I woke up, I was alone. I opened my eyes. Darkness, a blurry red light, the smell of stale beer, the back hallway at the Morrison's. I closed my eyes opened them. A red light was flashing under the exit sign. I stared at it for a minute while my eyes focused, and I tried to figure out what to do next. Behind me, I heard the muffled sound of an orchestra. I tried to sit up, but my stomach cramped, and I barely had time to turn over before I threw up. It caused a coughing fit, and it felt like my lungs were trying to escape through my mouth. I tried to breathe deeply, but it hurt too much, so I held my breath rising to my knees and then to my feet. I reached for the wall to steady myself. The flashing red light. I felt drunk. Drunk and sick all over. I was swaying, but my legs didn't wobble. Good. Thoughts came slowly. I decided the first thing I needed to do was get out of the hallway before Lavalier's goons came back or before someone else jumped me. I touched my cheek and my hand felt clammy again. It wouldn't be a bad idea to hit the restroom. Clean myself up and get out as quietly as possible. Not make myself a target. Reassess. Make a plan. Step outside the vortex of, why did she do it? How could she? My body, my... That was filling my head. In the bathroom, I clutched at the walls of the sink, staring into the mirror. I had a gash from my cheekbone to my left temple. Shit. Was there a ring on it? And my left eye was already starting to swell. There was a bruise on my cheek and my lips were bloody. Thankfully, I wasn't wearing vomit. I cleaned myself up as best I could with paper towels and water while thinking about my next steps. Get out quietly. Call an Uber. Get to the hospital. That was the plan. The club's dance floor was crowded and I felt like a bag of broken china so I made my way along the wall to the front door. As I approached our table, Jane saw me. Jim! She shrieked. Suddenly, all eyes were on me. Shit, Jim, are you okay? Asked Dave. No, Dave. I coughed into my hand. I'm not okay. Not even a little bit. We thought you left, Phil said. What happened? What the hell do you care? I wheezed. None of you. None of you bothered to check. D was the only one not looking at me. You knew, didn't you? I whispered. You helped her sneak out, left me bleeding on the floor. You dirty goddamn slut. M I didn't usually use language like that, and there was silence at the table. Jane's jaw dropped, and Barb looked like someone had slapped her. 
Dee threw her head up, her eyes blazing. Hey! exclaimed Dave after a moment. That's my wife! Don't tell me about your problems, Dave, I grinned grimly. I've got enough of my own. I looked at the fury on Dee's face. She took offense. How adorable. I couldn't help it. I burst into laughter. It hurt like hell, but I couldn't stop. I started coughing and blood splattered Dee's face. She screamed. I felt a spark of glee. I spit in her face. There was a lot of blood. What the hell? Screamed Jane, her chair falling over as she jumped up from the table. You don't know where I've been, Dee. I burst out laughing madly, feeling the copper taste in my mouth. You don't know where I've been. I swayed, and my legs became rubbery. Enough fun, and more than enough Fight Club quotes. I left my former friends horrified as they tried to clean D from my blood. The doorman was another Hulk. Well, unless it's a big man, he grinned. He lightly rubbed my ribs, and I felt something shift. Have a good night, Mike Tyson. And then I was on the sidewalk. The air was icy, and my chest felt tight. My heart was pounding. Screw Uber, I need an ambulance. I dialed 911. 9111, the voice on my phone said. What's your emergency? I've been beaten up, I wheezed. I'm in Morrison's, near the waterfront. Sir, sir, a voice said. Sir? I tried to answer. It was cold on the sidewalk, but very cozy. Next chapter. When I woke up, my throat was sore, but at least I could breathe. The smell of antiseptic. The beeps. The hospital. Thank God. I opened my eyes. A large window overlooked the nurse's station. My right arm was bandaged and tangled in the IV tubing as I pressed the call button on the bed rail. After a moment, a nurse appeared there. Don't try to talk, she said. I'll get you some ice chips. A moment later, she returned. The doctor will be here soon, she said, shoving a cup of ice into my hand and disconnecting the IV. Phone, I wheezed. Please. She took a clear plastic bag from the side table and carefully placed it next to me. These are your personal belongings. I don't know where your clothes are. She laughed softly. Then again, it doesn't look like you're going anywhere for a while. What a day. Today? It hurt to speak, but the melting ice helped. I found my phone in my bag. 27%. A few messages. Nothing from Linda. It's 4.30 Saturday afternoon. She picked up a chart from the edge of my bed. You're at Buffalo Hospital. You've been under sedation since you were brought in last night. My wife, I began. We've tried to contact her, but she's not answering. Don't! I wheezed. The nurse looked at me in surprise. I don't want to see her. I fumbled in my glass and took another ice cube. It is hospital policy to contact the next of kin, Mr. Carlyle. I'll call parents, I swallowed. Keep my wife away. She blushed. Yes, sir, she said. Besides, the police have been asking about you. I threw her a questioning look. It's standard policy to call them when someone comes in looking. Um, looking like you. I can't talk to them right now. I closed my eyes in pain. Later? Okay, she said softly. Is there anything else I can get you? A phone charger. I gulped. USB-C, please. I'll see what we can find. If you need anything, press the button. She smiled at me as she walked away. I wondered if I was going to be the last serving of juicy gossip in the department. I texted the parents and recounted the gist of the story, then sent them Mrs. Porter's phone number and asked them to check on the kids. They said they would come visit, but they live in Leroy, so I figured it would take a couple hours. A few minutes later, they sent a text saying that Linda had picked up Emma and Tommy the day before. Apparently, Mrs. Porter was pissed that we left the kids until three. Interesting. The next message was addressed to my friend Bailey. Well, he's kind of a friend, but he's basically my lawyer. 
We've known each other since college, and now he represents my business. It's weird having your contracts handled by a guy you used to do beer bongs with, but he's never left my side. I realized how important that was and how rare it was. Bailey, I need your help, I wrote. In the hospital, Buffalo General, need to see you as soon as possible. It only took a moment. I'm with the kids, but I'll be there tonight. No need to leave the family hanging. It'll all work out tomorrow. I'm at the in-laws' house, man. The kids are watching Frozen. You're doing me a favor. Maybe I should consider moving Bailey into the mostly a friend and also my lawyer category. Next chapter. Dr. Patel came by a little later and told me I was very lucky. Seriously, is this a requirement for doctors? Do they ever tell patients they're damn unlucky? I dislocated my wrist from hitting Lavalier's jaw, but other than that and a dislocated shoulder, all my limbs were intact. I took a few hard blows to the face and a minor concussion. It took 10 stitches to close my cheek, but nothing was broken. Patel said the scar would give me some character. He was a disturbingly cheerful guy. Below my neck I had three broken ribs, one of which had punctured a lung. I had a chest tube inserted, and the lung began to fill with air again. My chest was wrapped up like a mummy, and Dr. Patel predicted that I would have to stay in the hospital for a couple more days. That, at least, was good news. The last thing in the world I wanted to do was go home to my blushing fiancé. I was still awake after the doctor left, so I checked all social media. Jane's Facebook page had posted a clip of Linda and Lavalier dancing. She didn't name names, but Mrs. Weatherspoon, a widow who lived in our neighborhood, tagged Linda and me. Damn. I didn't bother reading the rest of the comments. I was already uncomfortable. Typing Morrison and blood into YouTube, I found a couple videos of me coughing on D. One of them, titled, Drunk Guy Vomits Blood, even showed me getting clipped by a doorman. Someone posted a little footage of me being scraped off the sidewalk by paramedics. According to Morrison's La Valliere, and there were videos of La Valliere and Linda dancing, and a few of me looking like a volcano waiting to erupt. One of them, posted by Moizu, was titled, My Boy is a Bull. It depicted the whole scene. La Valliere walks over to the table, picks up Linda, and leaves me with a sagging jaw. Throughout it all, Moizu kept up a running commentary, switching from Linda and La Valliere to me. Lavalier's hands on Linda's ass. My unblinking gaze. Fingers clutching a steak knife. What are you going to do with that knife, boy? Linda presses herself against Lavalier's ass. Fury. Is the baby going to cry? Laughter. I watch to the end. Watch the play of expressions on my face. Confusion, disbelief, anger, hurt, rage. I bookmarked the whole thing and then watch the video of me spitting on D a couple more times. It hurt to laugh, but still made me feel a little better. After that, I was completely exhausted. I curled up in the pillows. Next chapter. Bailey walked in with two cups of coffee. From the nurse's room, he said, handing one to me. Bailey, you old son of a bitch. I laughed. You've only been here five minutes and already you've charmed the entire staff. I took a sip and almost spit it out. Damn, you call that dirty coffee? He chuckled. He's doing his thing, JC. Now tell me what happened. After I told everything, Bailey looked grim. I've heard stories like this before, he said. Believe it or not, you were lucky. You and Dr. Patel should take your show on the road, I muttered. I'm not having much luck right now. There's a lot you don't know, JC. There are rumors on the streets about Lavalier and his gang. It seems our glorified tight end has gotten involved with some pretty bad players. In the off-season, he trades himself and his teammates to some cuckold. They seduce married women and then blackmail their husbands. If they got to Linda, that means they've already got other wives in your group. Hell, Morrison is their hunting ground. I thought of D. It was all coming together. How did this not make the news? If I'd known? Everyone knows, JC. 
the editor of the Buffalo News, the mayor, the police chief, the judges, the NFL commissioner, they're all being blackmailed. They even killed one guy. The official reports say it was suicide, but man, who shoots themselves in the back of the head and then takes their own heart, kidneys, liver, and lungs? Black market organ harvesting, exclaimed I. How? That's just the tip of the iceberg. Blackmail, extortion, human trafficking, suicide pods, and at least one playoff game that was probably rigged. They'll get more than a five-yard fine for that, I growled. What can we do? Well, there's a camp out west. I can send you there to keep you safe. Next chapter. When I woke up, I mumbled something about not wanting steak. It took me a minute to realize that I was still in the hospital, that Linda, for all her cruelty, was probably not a murderer sent to put me in a cage with a rooster and that I wanted a cup of coffee. By the time Bailey and my parents got to the hospital, the nightmare had dissipated and I was feeling much better. I waited until everyone was gathered. I only wanted to tell the story once. Mom and Dad had a hard time believing me, but social media left no room for doubt, and neither did my medical records. Say what you want about hospitals, but they do a great job of deciding if someone beat the crap out of you. Too bad we don't have videotape of them beating you up, JC, Bailey said. Sorry we didn't film it, dude. I coughed. Maybe if I'd been a little more warned. My dad gave me a regretful smile, but my mom looked shocked. I remembered the flashing red light in the back hallway. Hey, is there any way to get the security footage inside the club? Not without a court order, no, Bailey said. But if we can prove that a crime was committed... Well, I certainly didn't commit it myself, I said. You know, the cops came by earlier, but I still wasn't home. Can I file a police report? That would solidify my claims about Lavalier, Moises, and Smith. That's a good start, he said. I'll give them a call. If you don't mind, we can talk to them tomorrow. That'll work. And, you know, if we need proof, there's always my face. I'm pretty sure Lavalier's bare knuckles didn't tear my cheek. Maybe he was wearing a ring. Maybe a Super Bowl ring? pondered Bailey. Lavalier has one. He was in Kansas City before he was traded. That could be something. That's what I was thinking. I remembered my dream. What if it was a conspiracy, Bailey? He looked at me cheerfully. Look, I'll bet you anything that this isn't the only time Lavalier has done this. One, he signaled the team leader. Two, Moises pointed the camera at me before Lavalier even approached the table, which tells me he knew what was going on. Third, how well they knew the place. How did Lavalier know about the emergency exit? How did he guess to grab Linda coming out of the restroom? Why were the other football players there? Hell, man. If I hadn't been watching from the bar, they would have gotten away clean. So you're assuming that... What? Lavalier goes to this place regularly, steals some poor bastard's wife. He noticed the look on my face. Sorry, man. Basically, he picks up some poor bastard's wife, slips out the back door and takes her home. More or less. If the husband catches them, like me, he gets a whipping. Meanwhile, the club gets prestige from having famous football players hanging out there. Bailey smirked. Famous? Let's not get crazy, JC. It's the Bills. I grinned back. Okay, smartass. Regionally famous. Anyway, Lavalier advises the band leader to pick some slow songs to aid in the seduction and keep his teammates close by in case things get out of hand. He looked thoughtful. Interesting theory. But how do you prove it? If he's done this before, he's probably left a trail of videos like the one from last night, not to mention a lot of pissed-off husbands who'd be interested in telling their stories. I'll check social media, maybe send out a few messages. We'll see what we can find. I leaned back on the pillows. My mind was spinning with unanswered questions and possible leads, but I needed to focus on what was most important, Linda. While we're sorting all this out, could you find a divorce attorney for me? Maybe someone from your firm? Divorce. My mother sighed. Jim, that's so fast. Are you sure? I looked at my father. His eyes were sad, but he gave me a slight nod. Mom, she cheated on me. 
left me humiliated in a public place, turned her back on me when I got into a fight trying to protect our marriage. Now I don't feel safe living in the same house with her. My mom's face went white. Jim, you don't think she would... would hurt me? Would let someone bully me so she could get her way? I closed my eyes, took a deep breath. Mom, I don't think. I know. I can't trust her. There was nothing to say after that. Next chapter. I did my investigation and Bailey did hers, and when we met with the police on Sunday afternoon, we already had every reason to make a case. They were skeptical of my story, but when I showed them the video footage from Friday night, they perked up. After I showed them a series of videos of Lavalier at Morrison's over a six-month period, their smirks disappeared. I think when combined with my medical records, the story began to make sense to them, too. Later, my parents brought the kids to me, and we had a great time curled up on my hospital bed, watching Frozen on Emma's iPad. Given my mom's reaction to my divorce filing, I expected her to be in favor of reconciliation, but she surprised me. On Sunday, according to Dad, she read Linda the Riot Act. I never found out what she said, but it was clear that Linda wasn't coming to the hospital anytime soon. As I watched Frozen with the kids, I came up with some great revenge scenarios, but they were just dreams. I couldn't fight. I couldn't maim. I didn't have the money to kill Lavalier, and I wasn't about to send the mother of my children to a Mexican brothel. After all, I had a good lawyer, a moderately healthy bank account, a growing business, and a knack for telling stories. Good stories. Convincing stories. I started thinking about storytelling about public storytelling. Given my line of work, I'm surprised it's taken me this long. Blame the concussion. Jane's post got a couple hundred comments, from people berating me for being a wuss to people berating Linda for being a phony. Pretty much what I expected. I created my own post, which I've linked to. Dear friends, family, and neighbors, as you may have heard by now, Friday night my wife Linda cheated on me. You may have seen the videos of her dancing with Marc Lavalier, our city's celebrated quarterback. But those videos don't tell the whole story, and I believe you deserve to know everything that happened. I have outlined my story and provided links to all the videos I have collected. I noted everyone involved, including Moises, Smith, Lavalier, Morrison, and the people sitting at our table. I even found the Facebook page of the band that was performing that night, and plugged them into the conversation. And finally, I summarized it. That was it. My wife cheated on me with one of the most famous sports stars in town. When I objected, he and his teammates sent me to the hospital. As far as I can tell, this was done with the consent, and in some cases, the active support of our friends, the club we attended, and even Morrison's house band. I pride myself on taking care of my family, but when you have the Bill's offensive line in front of you, a table full of traitorous friends, and a wife who has decided that a night of fun is worth more than her marriage. Well, there's not much you can do. I have already filed a police report detailing the events of that night and will begin divorce proceedings against Linda as soon as possible. In the meantime, I hope all of you will take this opportunity to think about what each of us owe each other. Think about loyalty. Think about love. Think about friendship, and while you're here, think twice before you go to Morrison's on Friday night. Bailey thought it was a bit instructive and probably bordering on online harassment. Then a random Generation Z kid, who happens to have a grandfather in Timber Ridge and happens to love ziplining, dramatically read my post on TikTok, and the whole thing went viral. Needless to say, Bailey went into apoplexy. Fortunately, the district attorney wasn't as concerned about online harassment as she was about physical assault, and she secured a court order requiring Morrison's Club to produce the recordings made on February 28th. At first, club management balked, claiming that the security cameras weren't working that night. But when the DA expanded the court order to include 12 other nights when Lavalier was videotaped dancing with another man's wife, apparently they decided the case was done. The DA also demanded that Lavalier turn over his Super Bowl ring for examination, which caught the attention of Bill's management. 
He, Moises, and Smith were suspended. It didn't mean much, since the season was already over, but it's the thought that counts. Meanwhile, Bailey found me a divorce lawyer. Dolores Cartwright was ingenuous, straightforward, and thankfully, willing to make a home visit to the hospital. In the absence of any real evidence of adultery, we settled on an irrevocable separation. I asked for primary custody, the house, and full control of my business. In return, I offered all of our joint savings and agreed to assume full responsibility for the mortgage with the stipulation that we split the equity when Tommy went to college. According to standard calculations, there was virtually no child support or alimony. It was a generous offer, especially since I had not insisted that the district attorney charge Linda as an accessory to my assault. Nevertheless, the terms required Linda to move out as soon as I was fully recovered and able to care for the children. We agreed that if she resisted, we would reapply for cruel and inhuman treatment. Even if the judge didn't agree, it would definitely shake her reputation in the community. With Dolores's guidance, I closed our joint credit cards, dropped Linda from my insurance, and did all the other little things one does when deciding to separate from a spouse. Linda and I had always kept separate bank accounts, at her insistence, so separating our finances was pretty easy. While I did all the legal paperwork, Linda went about her business. When my mom forbade her from visiting me in the hospital, she started complaining to anyone who would listen that I was doing her wrong. She also responded to my Facebook post, stating that she didn't know what happened after she turned her back on me in the parking lot and reasserting her right to enjoy the opportunity she had that night. I, of course, disagreed with that, as did almost everyone who commented on her post. I had a lot of fun reading the reactions, though it still hurts to laugh. Next chapter. After a couple of days in the hospital, Dr. Patel told me that since the morgue didn't need me, he was going to let me out the front door. I pretended to giggle and told him not to quit his job. While I was recovering, I stayed with my parents. Mom and Dad shuttled the kids back and forth a couple times, which gave me a chance to keep up with them and watch Frozen a few more times. I'm not sure if it helped my recovery or not, but Emma and Tommy's presence definitely lifted my spirits. Lying in my old bed at Mom and Dad's house, I had plenty of time to reflect on my relationship with Linda. I realized that I had spent the last few years in some sort of self-imposed fog. Between the kids, work, politics, the weather, and many other things, I had chosen to overlook Linda's anti-masculine remarks, her bouts of condescension, her need for control, and a host of other little warning signs. I brushed them off as aberrations, when in fact they were a very real part of who she was. The person I thought she was would never do what she did to me. Consequently, the person I thought she was. Well, it wasn't the real Linda. After a week, I felt much better. It took time for the bruises to fade, the scars to heal, and the splint to come off my arm, but I could already walk, dress myself, and breathe almost normally. By then, Linda had received my divorce petition. Bailey hadn't heard back from her yet, but my parents had. She wanted to talk. I sent her a text, setting up a meeting at my parents' house. When she walked in wearing a blue dress, thankfully not that blue dress, I had a sense of deja vu. I remembered the last time we were together, her in a blue dress, me in a suit, going to Morrison's. I thought about how one night had illuminated so much in our relationship, and, in the clear light of day, how the relationship I'd been thinking about had evaporated. And yet, even when feelings have faded and hearts are broken, manners remain. Linda, I said, you look good. Linda smiled shyly at me. You too, Jim. The lie sounded almost sincere. Her gaze scanned the stitches in my cheek, my black eyes, the splint on my arm, and she looked away. Thank you for agreeing to meet with me. I shrugged. It was bound to happen. We have two kids. We should be able to get along with them, if not more. I pictured Atticus Finch, Perry Mason, Longfellow Deeds, people who would have the words, the eloquence, the righteousness to face this moment and win. No, it had to be me, my words. And the usual script was no good. 
What do you think is going on here, Linda? What do you want to get out of this little conversation? Linda paused for a second. I wasn't saying the phrases she wanted to hear. Jim, if I had known I was going to hurt you, I would have never... Stop it! Snapped at me. She jerked as if I'd slapped her. Stop saying, it didn't mean anything. It was just one night. It was just sex. Just stop. And while we're doing that, let's skip the next part. If you let me have that night, if you didn't follow me, it's your own fault you were hurt. Let's just skip to the end. What is your ultimate goal? What do you want? Linda wasn't used to seeing this side of me. She blinked. I... I want you to come home, she said quietly, carefully. I want you to be with your kids. You can stop that too. You can't play the children or the loving wife card. While I was fighting for our family Friday night, you were running off with a big strong jock and having fun with him in the car. Her eyes widened. Didn't think I'd seen that, did you? Congratulations, Linda. You got what you wanted. You hooked up with a football player and now you can brag about it to Dee and the girls. But you can't hide behind the backs of the kids just because you found out that the price of your big night is higher than you expected. Then I spoke the words I knew would really tick her off. Besides, it's not a question of whether or not I'm coming home. I will. The question is whether you will stay there. Jim, of course I'll stay there. Her eyes narrowed. And if you try to take the kids away from me, you'll lose. The wife always gets the kids. Everyone knows that. No, honey, the kids go to the primary caretaker. The one who makes lunches, takes the kids to school and picks them up. Goes to doctor's appointments and parent-teacher conferences. Which one of us do you think does that? She blushed with anger. I take care of our family. We do it together. We're equals. She had a look of triumph as if she'd found the secret phrase that would make everything better. Equals. The problem was, our night at Morrison's had sucked all the magic out of that word. I sighed. You always said we were equals. Partners. But you don't really see it that way, do you? I've spent years listening to your snotty comments about little boys being led around or having emotional depth like a cocker spaniel. And you always end with something like, but not you, honey. You're different. You're special. But you don't really believe that, do you? You believe you'll use the kids as leverage to get your simple-minded, slightly dumb husband to come home, and then you'll lead him around by the nose until it's over. I'm sorry, Linda, but steak isn't going to fix the situation. She tried to look smug, but she couldn't do it. Be realistic, Jim. You're going to give up everything, your kids, your family, our lives, for one night? I snorted. That's the thing, Linda. I've never really had you, have I? Friday night proved it. I paused. Had I really wanted to get to this point? And then I saw the little smirk playing around the edges of her mouth that told me that after Mark, I would always come second. She was the alpha who could snag the football star, and I was the beta who was lucky enough to snag her. Screw it, why not? Her mouth dropped open. I'm sorry, Linda, but you're not the best thing in my life. Honestly, you're not even in the top five. But we, but you, she hissed. I shrugged. I suppose you may have loosened up for Marky, but I'd still be surprised if you were in his top 100. If I had to put money on it, I'd bet that the most exciting thing for him that night was that he took you away from me. I think he has some daddy issues, but that's just between him and his therapist. What, no, he picked me. I was the most beautiful woman there. You weren't some great conqueror. At best, you were a Friday night prize. The weekly trophy he gets for being the biggest, strongest jock in the house. I... I'm not a trophy. She blushed, furious. That's incredibly insulting. I chuckled. You're right, it is. But let's be clear. I'm not the one who made that argument. You did. Before tonight... There's no way I would have said you were some mindless prize that gets passed from person to person. I shrugged. But you proved me wrong. You showed me that you wouldn't hesitate to sell out our marriage, our family, and even yourself for bragging rights in some fanciful Cinderella fantasy with a second-rate celebrity. Screw you, Jim. He was a trophy. 
He was the best man in that room and I got him. You should be proud of that. Proud of your wife. But, but your ego can't handle it. I wondered if she could hear the words flying out of her mouth. Whether she realized that with each syllable, she was throwing another shovelful of dirt into the coffin of her marriage. I knew I couldn't get through to her, but something, maybe our time together, or the love I still felt for her, compelled me to try. Toxic male ego, huh? I've been waiting for this one. Is this when you start talking about how pathetic it is when men rely on force and aggression to get what they want? How weak we are. I smiled grimly. And what did you do to prove it? Turned your back on the man who took care of our family for ten years. Clung to a muscular, handsome man who would do anything but drag you home by your hair. He didn't. I held up my hand. How many times have we talked about how disgusting it is when men use aggression to get what they want without the consent of those around them? But that's exactly what Marc Lavalier did on Friday. And you, a woman who preaches equality and claims to value commitment, you turned your back on your faithful husband and used toxic femininity to get what you wanted. Toxic femininity, she hissed. That, it doesn't even exist. Of course there is, Linda. What would you call it when a woman uses her body to seduce a random guy, even at the cost of her family? When she publicly humiliates the man she claims to love? Hides behind her children when it benefits her, but ignores them when they get in the way of her snagging a random stud? If that's not toxic, what is? It's not about toxicity. It's about, about choice. She straightened up. This was solid ground. This is about freedom. My body. My choice. Linda, let's ignore the fact that you're taking a slogan that was coined to support a woman's right to choose abortion and using it to justify having fun with a jerk who drives an Escalade. Let's just ignore that for a second. You're arguing that you have the right to pick up a guy at a bar, go home with him, regardless of my wishes. Is that more or less your position? Yes, but... Let me finish. You're talking about choices. Now you chose to marry me too to build a life, to have children together. When you made that choice, I didn't twist your arms, right? Great. Yes. She stared at me. Linda, those options, having fun with no one and having a family with me, can't coexist. You have to choose one or the other. For most of our marriage, you chose the kids and me. At Morrison's, you made your choice. And because you changed your choice, I'm changing mine. You have no right to... I slapped the table. I have every right. I stared at her. I also have the right to say, my body, my choice. I have the right to choose a woman who will stand by my side and defend our marriage. Who will give up fun with a handsome stranger in favor of a life she says she cherishes. Someone who shares my values and has a modicum of integrity. Screw you and your integrity. Her face turned purple, and I wondered if she was about to hit. You don't have the courage to deal with it, so you... You... You run away like a hurt little boy. And you hide your behavior behind your children and a vague idea of yourself as a free, independent woman. Let's get this straight. You claim that women are equal to men. And by the way, I agree with that. But if that's true, then they have equal responsibility. Have you ever heard the phrase, with great power comes great responsibility? Is that a quote from Obama? She rolled her eyes. No, it's from Spider-Man. Linda grinned, and I smiled back. Sure, Stan Lee isn't a feminist theorist or a famous social critic, but he's relevant here. You demand equal power in our relationship, but you refuse to take equal responsibility. You want to be a big, strong woman making her way in the world. But when it suits your purposes, you happily hide behind the prejudice that women are automatically better parents just because they have a uterus. You want society to ignore your body in the boardroom, but you're more than willing to pounce on it in the club, the bedroom, or the courtroom. You want the immense power that is given to an equal partner, but you don't have the courage to take on the immense responsibility to exercise that power honestly. That's nonsense. I simply refuse to. I refuse to let a man define me. You are not my master. 
You are not my overseer. That's enough, snapped I. You think you're a radical, but at the end of the day, you're just another woman watching two boys fight over her and spread her legs for the winner. Nothing could be more simple, more boring and traditional. Honestly, it went on from there. Epilogue A couple days later, I moved back home. To the guest room, of course. Although I would have preferred to avoid Linda completely, her job still required her to come in between 9 and 5, and she relied on Mrs. Porter, who was still mad at her, to handle the kids in the mornings and afternoons. Emma and Tommy were suffering, and it was time for me to step in. Back home, I quickly got back into my old routine, combining work and childcare. As for Linda and I, we managed to avoid fighting in front of the kids, mostly by avoiding each other completely. I consider that a victory. Meanwhile, my various legal proceedings continued to slowly move forward. It turned out that I had indeed left DNA on Lavalier's ring. This, combined with the surveillance footage in the parking lot and in Morrison's back hallway, proved conclusively that Lavalier, Moises, and Smith had ripped me off. They became attorneys and were able to plead guilty to third-degree assault, which entailed a small fine. On the other hand, they also had to pay my hospital bill. And by the next season, Lavalier was traded. I hear Detroit is even colder than Buffalo. The assault conviction came in handy when Lavalier's ten victims, including me, filed a class action lawsuit for intentional infliction of mental anguish. Moises diligently recorded Lavalier's nights at Morrison's, and his video, complete with commentary, was eventually played in court. All of the plaintiffs received seven-figure sums. My case involved a seven-figure sum after Bailey received his share. He also received a portion of the six-figure sum we received from Morrison's for their complicity that night. Needless to say, the videotape of the bouncer's lovemaking came in handy. I'm still trying to figure out where Bailey is on the lawyer-friend spectrum. Linda hired an attorney, who I assume took one look at the whole mess and advised her to sign the papers. Eventually, she gave in, and we began the process of learning how to co-parent. Our conversation at my parents' house made it clear that we were both carrying a lot of baggage and it was affecting how we behaved with our kids, so we started seeing a psychologist to help us build a less toxic relationship. It took a long time and a lot of yelling, but we found a way to treat each other with civility, if not warmth. We sent the kids to therapy too, but kids Emma and Tommy's age are usually pretty resilient, and eventually we came to a point where we could be in the same room without monsters from the past rearing their ugly heads. After that night, I never saw the pair again. I had heard rumors that Dee and Dave had broken up, and Jane and Phil were having problems, but I never tried to follow up on it. Frankly, I didn't care. And so, a year later, I found myself without a wife, but with a fat bank account full of Marc Lavalier's money, most of which I had poured back into my business. I was still the primary caretaker of my children, and miracle of miracles. They had moved on from Frozen. Now they were all excited about Wall-E. It's a good movie. I give it six months before I learn to hate it. Life has gotten a lot better. While I'm still working through some of the moments from that night, I'm also gathering a new group of friends. I can imagine that in the not-too-distant future, I'll be ready to date again, at least on those nights when Linda is with the kids. But not all scars have healed. I still hate watching the Bills and have become the only Dolphins fan in my neighborhood. Prejudice is real. The end. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.